Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. I'm Daita Sergi, Education Programs Manager with AISHI, and I'll be the moderator today. It is my pleasure to welcome you all. As many of you know, AISHI's mission is to inspire and catalyze higher education to lead the global sustainability transformation. We are an international association with about a thousand members spread across more than 20 countries, including Australia and South Africa. And just a second, my screen is <laughs> playing tricks on me. Um, let's get here again. So we are the professional home for campus sustainability staff, but we offer resources for everyone in higher education. We provide an expensive collection of online resources, networking tools and educational events such as today's webinar, as well as an annual conference and expo. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Everyone in the audience is on mute, but please feel free to ask questions or provide comments at any point during the presentation. You can do that by typing your questions or comments in the questions pane in the control panel on your screen. If you have additional questions, please email them to Aishi to aishi at education at aishi.org and we will get back to you. At the end of the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to provide feedback regarding today's presentation. We take your suggestions into account when planning for future webinars, so please do provide this feedback. Please note this webinar is being recorded. If you experience technical difficulties or have to leave early, you and others can view the recording later. However, Please note that the recording and presentation materials are available to the AC members only. And they will be posted in the Campus Sustainability Hub after the live broadcast. At this time, I'd like to introduce today's webinar presenter. Christine has been with Stanford University's Residential and Dining Enterprises as the Manager of Sustainability and Utilities Program for the last seven years. It is my pleasure to welcome all attendees and thank you for joining us today. At this time, I'm going to turn things over to Christine to get us started. All right. Um, hopefully you guys can all see my screen. Um, I am very excited to be here today to talk to you about how Stanford has transformed the way uh, we clean. Uh, Stanford is a very proud ASHE member and uh, ASHE Platinum Institution, and this cleaning program that I'm going to talk to you about, we actually use and contribute to our score to help us get there, so um, that's one connection. Um, so where do I sit in the uh, university? So um, for those of you who don't know, Stanford is actually a largely residential campus. We're one of the largest, um, while we may not have the largest student population, um, we have one of the largest um, amounts of residents that actually live on our campus. We house um, 15,000 students um, on our core campus um, and 319 buildings that are just housing, um, dining, catering, um, cafe type facilities. Um, so this is the area I work. We're about a third of the campus, the 319 buildings. Um, I oversee 525 lease spaces. Um, we have eight major dining halls that serve around three and a half million meals annually. So this is where we are um, primarily um, implementing this, um, this new cleaning program I'm going to tell you about. So at a very high level, um, Stanford has many sustainability goals. Um, you know, we're trying to be 100% renewable electricity by 2021, um, carbon free by 2025, a zero waste campus by 2030, which actually these uh, cleaning goals actually support. Um, and then most specifically to this, um, you'll see down there on the lower right, um, we plan to be 100% ozone-based cleaning by 2025 across um, our system. And so that's the goal that um, I'm going to be talking about how we're meeting today. So what is ozone um, cleaning? So um, this, what you see on the screen here is completely um, my, my kind of viewpoint on this and um, my definition, I would say. So um, I see kind of this is the spectrum of 
cleaning product on the market. So on one end, you have traditional cleaning chemicals, which hopefully you guys can all imagine those because I don't want to mention any. Um, and then in the middle, I see green cleaning, which is, um, again, I don't want to mention any products, but you can probably imagine the things you think about when you, you know, go to the store or things um, you may be using commercially that call themselves um, green cleaners. And then on the far right, I see ozone cleaning. And that's that's what we're doing, which I, I see is the true heart of sustainability. So um, throughout this presentation, I, I use ozone cleaning, green cleaning to mean uh, generally things that are better for the environment, better for human health. But really, um, I think ozone cleaning is kind of so far above and beyond where we need to go as uh, you know, a community as a world um, um, into the future in terms of sustainability that I almost even hate lumping it with like other, you know, what is termed green cleaners um, on the market. Um, and I just threw up here, this is like the Wikipedia definition of green cleaning because I thought it was pretty comprehensive just for those that, that need that definition. But um, this is kind of where I see um, all of these different things on the market falling. And so why do I feel so strongly about ozone cleaning is kind of next and what is ozone cleaning? So um, basically um, we have the scientific definition up here. It's basically you use electricity to add an extra oxygen mo molecule to O2 creating O3 um, and you infuse it in water. And so in simple terms, we are electrifying water. We are using a machine on site to create a solution on site uh, for cleaning by electrifying it. Um, kind of an example picture of that is on the, the lower right. So why do I feel like this is so great? So um, what's great about creating um, your own solution or electrified water, or some people call engineered water, is all of these amazing benefits it provides. So um, once you electrify the water, um, over time, it actually just converts back to water. So what's better than that, right, for the for the environment? You're using water, you're using electricity, and then it goes back to water and oxygen in the end. So there's really no, uh, you know, harmful um, byproduct from that. Um, and then the other killer benefit is that it is just as powerful as traditional uh, cleaning chemicals on the market. So it it kills mold, mildew, odor, stains, bacteria, viruses. Its kill time is amazing. It's like less than a minute. Um, we have other products that we use in house or have used before that have like a 10 to 15 minute kill time. This is, um, you know, more powerful and factor, faster acting than bleach. Um, I know I got a lot of bullets on here, but they're all really valid and important. Another one, as I mentioned, our zero waste goal. Um, and by converting to ozone cleaning, we've really reduced plastic pollution. Think about all of the, you know, by creating this on site, we are not buying all of those products anymore. We're not disposing all those uh, products anymore, which is a lot of plastic. Um, and more so, um, the company that we work with actually um, takes back the machines and the filters um, and refurbishes and uses them again. So really, um, it's a great partnership for our zero waste goal. Um, obviously, it's really great for human health. Um, there actually is no PP&E required, and what PP&E stands for is per personal protective equipment. Um, we actually still ask our custodians to wear gloves and eye protective equipment, but it's awesome because we don't have to worry about them um, harming themselves by using it. If it touches their skin or gets in their eye, or, there really is no harmful side effect, but we still ask them to wear it regardless. Um, there's no smell to it. And I put that in quotes because um, if you compare the smell of it to any other cleaner on the market, uh, a normal person would say there's no smell. But once you use it for a while, you can kind of see like a very faint smell. So I don't wanna say there's no smell, but really when you compare it to everything else there, out there, there is no smell. Um, and then the other beautiful thing is that it's completely multi-purpose. You can use it on everything from toilets to mirrors, to glass, to toilets, to showers, to carpet. It can even be a laundry detergent. It's pretty crazy. Um, so one of the great things it did was it completely reduced our um, training needs and risks around using chemicals um, with our custodians. So um, the picture you see here on the left is our traditional cleaning cart. Um, and at the time I started this over five years ago, we, we found in our inventory, we had well over 30 different types of chemical solutions that um, 
people were using. This looks like a very typical cart. You see probably like 16 different things, you know, one thing for windows, one thing for toilets, one thing for glass, one thing for, you know, everything. And you can imagine what it was like uh, inventorying these, keeping track of these, um, all the hazardous um, waste disposal surrounding these. Um, so when we adopted ozone cleaning, we basically went down to two solutions and that's all people needed to remember and know about. So um, on the right here, you see um, we have one solution, which is a, a multi-purpose for everything that I, I mentioned that it can do. Um, and then on the, um, on the right, the blue is a degreaser. So the only thing that this ozone cleaning solution doesn't do is degrease. Um, and so we have to have a solution for that. And just to make sure everybody knows what I mean by that, for us, um, the main place that we're degreasing is in showers. So we have community showers where you know, dozens and dozens of students will take showers in a given restroom um, in any given day, and they're using tons of products, right? Shampoos, conditioners, body washes, um, and all of that leaves basically great grease residue in these showers. So the main thing that we're degreasing on a weekly basis um, is our showers, um, and um, the main ozone solution is not going to uh, degrease for you or like on a very greasy kitchen countertop or something like that. So, um, so that's why we went from nearly over 30 to two. So now that everyone has a little bit of background on what ozone cleaning is and the very high level, what it can do for you, um, really it's, you know, how, did, how did we get started? So um, back in 2014, I have to credit this beautiful, wonderful student down here on the picture on the right. Her name's Taylor Streety. Um, she was a senior at Stanford, very bright, and she was also a member of the student organization Students for Sustainable Stanford on campus, who was trying to promote sustainable operations on campus. And for years, my organization had been trying trying to move to green cleaning, and we had a lot of traditional chemical companies come in and um, try to sell us on new products that they were developing and they were calling green cleaning products, other vendors coming in saying they had green cleaning products. And we had, you know, tried out a whole host of things. All of them failed miserably. Um, we were about at the point to just kind of give up on it. And then Taylor came to us and said uh, she had done all this research on ozone cleaning and um, she wanted us to look into it. And the more we looked into it, we said, okay, this is totally different than anything we've ever tried. Um, let's give it a pilot and see how it goes. So my management um, invested in it and we had a great partnership. I mean, you can see in this picture, we have our custodian who actually had chemical sensitivities, um, was one of our first custodians to try it. Um, our health and safety manager was involved, the building manager involved, my senior management was involved, and then we had students involved um, in this pilot. And we chose to pilot it at a sorority house of all of our 319 buildings, the Delta 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 sorority house, uh, mainly because Taylor was living at the house at the time and we knew we could um, have a great partner in terms of student communication. So it was kind of a safe place. Um, but the other great thing about Tri-Delta was that um, it was um, it's in a place where there are five other sororities that are just like it. And by just like it, I mean as the exact same number of students, the building is exactly the same, the surfaces that custodians would be working on are exactly the same. So we had set up this perfect like experiment where Lourdes, our custodian here, was cleaning um, with the ozone solution and Delta, Delta, Delta and traditional cleaning chemicals in um, Pi Beta Phi right next door. So we had this great base case and experimental case. Um, so what were the results? So what this was in 2015. Um, so we did, you know, we're at an academic institution. So we took a very research based approach. We did pre and post um, occupant surveys um, that uh, revealed. So before we installed it, after we installed it, we had the students surveyed, you know, saying how um, how confident they felt that their space was being cleaned and how happy they were with it because of course we wanted our occupants to be comfortable um, and basically what the results of the occupant surveys showed was that students felt it was just as clean as it was with the old chemicals and that's great right um, as long as it they feel like it's clean um, that's all we needed to know um, and we had really high response rates almost the entire house were responding to these surveys thanks to taylor um, we also had a lot of feedback from the custodian. We did uh, frequently met with her to see how things were going, how it was like using the system with other 
um, um, you know, on different types of surfaces and different scenarios, um, and then how it was, you know, using it there compared to Pi Beta Phi. Um, and then the the most uh, kind of telling um, thing for us is we also did bacteria testing. You can see on the lower right here, this is an ATP meter, um, and I did a ton of bacteria testing. So I would test with Lourdes right before she cleaned um, and right after she cleaned at both Tri Delta and Pi Beta Phi so I could compare the results. Um, and what I found basically was that whether she was using the ozone cleaning system or whether she was using the traditional cleaning system, um, right after she cleaned, the bacteria levels would be the exact same or like definitely right around each other, which was at a good level. So both traditional cleaning and ozone cleaning were getting to like the same, you know, good, you know, quote unquote, good level of, of cleanliness. Um, but what we found was, I also mentioned we tested right before she would clean. Um, and what we noticed, what was cool about the ozone cleaning was that the bacteria levels were always lower before she cleaned in Tri Delta compared to Pi Beta Phi. And what that told us was that the traditional cleaning chemicals um, was leaving a residue and it was actually attracting, while, while they both got um, the houses to an acceptable, the same acceptable clean level after being cleaned, um, the traditional chemicals were leaving a residue and actually attracting more bacteria over time. So when we tested again the next day before she cleaned again, the um, the ozone cleaning was actually attracting less bacteria, which was a really uh, neat and cool finding that, that came out of this. So um, after we finished this pilot, my management was very pleased with the results. And so um, we ended up going out kind of with a RFP process where we invited um, several different companies that claim to have ozone um, systems or had ozone systems to campus and we ended up selecting one um, which is the one we also ended up using at Tri Delta which is called Tersano. Um, and the next question for my management um, as we looked at expanding it after we had selected a vendor was okay they said okay Kristen you've you've said you showed me it's good for the environment you showed me students feel their spaces are clean um, you know, the, the people side, you know, custodians liked it, the students liked it, so that's the people side, and the, great for the environment, so what about the triple bottom line, the profit or the economics of it? So we looked at chemical purchases across our entire 319 building system, and we looked at the payback period of investing and shifting over to this um, new system and we found that the payback period for all of our buildings they range because different you know different buildings were cleaning differently with different amounts of chemicals so depending on the building the payback period um, ranged between two and a half and five and a half years and uh, basically here anything with a payback period less than five years that kind of hits that triple bottom line is a, a go it's a shoe in um, so my management was super happy about this, um, but I want to say, because I know it's very important to people thinking about this and the economics and finance, you know, finance of it is um, the payback period that we calculated included um, chemical savings alone. So we were just looking at um, what we were going to save by not purchasing, you know, all those 30 other chemicals that I showed you. We did not include any um, employee health benefits from not being exposed to chemicals any longer or injury claims associated with chemical related or cleaning related um, energy uh, injuries. We didn't incorporate any kind of en environmental savings. Um, we didn't incorporate the cost of receiving and distribu distributing chemicals. Um, we did a report later that found that we spend almost, you know, two thousand dollars a month, kind of receiving, ordering, and distributing chemicals that would no longer need to happen. So that wasn't included in the payback period. Um, and then um, things that we we also didn't include, but could have included, um, was any. Um, infrastructure upgraded is needed to support the system. So you're generating this electrified water on site. So what do you think you need? You need water and you need energy. So we actually had some custodial closets that didn't have outlets. Um, you know, buildings that were built in the 40s, 50s. You know, we have buildings built, you know, 100 years ago and, you know, this year. And so um, many of our buildings didn't have electrical outlets in the custodial closets. Um, some of them didn't have sinks. Um, so um, in this payback period, we didn't include any infrastructure upgrade that was needed via outlets or sinks to support um, the new machines. Um, and then lastly, something for you all to consider is convenience. So 
um, like I said, this machine is something, you know, you're producing your own cleaning solution now, um, and one machine can produce a lot, right? And so there's multiple ways you can set this up. You know, I've talked to others that are using this system, and you can have a 12-story building and only have one machine, but then your custodians are all going to one machine, you know, every day to get that, and then they have to bring it to the various floors to clean or to other buildings to clean. Or you can put like one on every floor in a 12-story building. So our strategy, and obviously based on, you know, where you place these machines and how you move chemicals, you know, varies your payback period. And my management's philosophy was that um, in order for custodians to really buy into this, it needed to be just as convenient as their traditional chemicals were. So any place in our system where a custodian would go to get traditional chemicals, um, we had to have a, a Tersano machine where they could equally you know, get access to um, that solution. So that affected our payback period because um, we basically have custodial closets with chemicals on every floor of every building so where you know one organization strategy might be one per three floor building we have three you know one on every single floor so that's something something to think about so where are we at today so i mentioned we did that original pilot one sorority house um, that went well and so it's been almost five years we are now in 70, billion, uh, 70 buildings, um, which impacts 3 million square feet in our portfolio. We have 8,800 uh, students and staff that are residing in these buildings and benefiting from this new type of cleaning system. We have over 85 full-time custodians that are trained in using it on a, a daily basis, and then dozens and dozens more of like temporary and casual workers. Um, and we've calculated we've saved a little, we're saving a little over 4,000 gallons of um, chemicals from being purchased and disposed of annually by converting to this. And I actually just hired a student intern who's looking at uh, plastic pollution and how much plastic we've reduced from um, going from the landfill from this decision too to support our zero waste goals um, and targets. So, um, as I mentioned, um, things are going well and it's very safe. And so our next step was to think about, um, can we offer this to students? It's so safe. I mean, you think about traditional chemicals on the market and you know, you think there's no way I would give that to a student. There's just too much liability um, and them not reading the directions, not using it correctly, et cetera. But this is so safe that um, really there's no problem providing it to students for them to use. Um, 50% of the, the buildings that I mentioned, um, custodians only clean common spaces. So they're apartments where students are actually responsible for cleaning the apartments themselves. Um, and so obviously we do a lot of things to encourage them to clean their apartments because at the end of the year when they leave, if they haven't cleaned for an entire year, you can imagine how challenging it is to clean an apartment or a bathroom that has literally not been cleaned for a year. Um, so not only was this obviously a, a great you know, uh, solution for students to consider using, but it was also great for us operationally because by providing, being able to provide students a cleaning solution, it's encouraging them to actually clean and make our jobs easier and take care of our facilities better. Um, so we first piloted offering it to students in a building called Miralee's. It's a 289 student apartment complex. And um, the student you see on the left here, his name is Arjun, and he was our intern champion. He also lived in the building and he did, again, pre and post surveys. And we surveyed all of these students that lived in Miralee's and we asked them about their chemical you know, cleaning behaviors. So how often do you clean? Um, when do you typically clean? We asked them where they got their cleaning products. Most of them said Safeway, Target, Trader Joe's. We asked them what type of cleaning products they use. Um, you're probably not surprised, but students love disposables. So they used a lot of the disinfecting wipes, you know, that you can buy. They, a lot of them had Swiffers with Swiffer pad situations. Um, a lot of that, and we calculate. We asked them how much they spent on cleaning chemicals annually, and we added it all up. Um, just this one building with these almost 300 students spend about $10,000 of their student money annually just buying cleaning or chemical-related products. Um, so if they all decided to use this machine, then you know the building would save basically $10,000 in student money, which is obviously students are trying to. Um, 
you know, conserve uh, their, their money at this time. So um, we installed it in the laundry room. So all the students in that building have a single laundry room. So we installed it in the laundry room. So it's a common space where they all go. Um, and the great thing about the laundry room is um, it can also be used as a laundry detergent. So um, while they're in there, they can fill up a cup and use it as a laundry detergent. And so on the right here, you see Arjun, who's giving a training um, to students that live in this building about how to use the machine and the benefits of it um, and why they should um, um, consider using it to clean their apartments. And he also doubled that, our operations loved, he did a, a training on how to clean. You'd, imagine, you'd be surprised at how many students come to campus and they have no exposure to how to clean a toilet themselves or how to clean a shower themselves. Um, so he also uh, met with some custodians and they gave him some tips and then he shared the tips with the students on good clean, you know, how frequently they should clean and how they should clean and to use this to clean essentially and how the machine works. Um, and then this is just a student um, dispensing from the machine and some signage that we have. So even if they don't come to the training, they see the signage and are able to interact and know what it is and dispense it themselves. Um, this is some signage, um, another pilot we did in a non-apartment complex. So this is your traditional dorm where you have lots of students, um, you know, in rooms with shared bathrooms. And we had a really uh, active building manager who loved it and their custodians loved it. And they said, we want to give it to our students. And so they left these bottles. It says, hey, Wilbur, um, here's some free cleaning solution for you. And they leave it in the bathrooms. And I love it because, you know, students, you know, you're living in a tiny room with a, another student. If your roommate gets sick, I mean, it's brilliant. Go grab a bottle and disinfect and sanitize, you know, your knobs, your room quickly. Um, it's a quick way for them to, you know, grab something, you know, when custodians aren't around um, um, where they can easily clean their rooms and also common area spaces while, you know, custodians may not necessarily be in the building. So um, we also tried um, this out as well. Um, so um, coming this year, which I'm very excited about, these buildings that you see um, just came out of the ground and uh, we're opening four 12-story apartment high-rises um, on campus that it's going to house 2,400 grad students. And um, we're at the point now where, you know, we're fully implementing this. So every single floor of these 12-story buildings have um, these machines in the laundry rooms for students to um, dispense their cleaning solution and also their laundry detergent to um, keep these buildings clean. We actually have three machines going in on every floor and all 12 floors, two custodial accessed and then one um, student accessed. So um, we're opening these buildings next summer and then all of these students will be able to benefit. And also the surrounding grad students will also be able to enter the ground floors and if they want access, they technically could as well. So um, next is, it wasn't all that easy, right? I mean, I'm, I'm painting this, this, this picture of success, but um, it, it's been you know, five years of creating a new culture of cleaning. Um, we have a great custodial staff here and the average, you know, they've been here a long time. Most of our custodians have been with us for 15 plus years. Um, and you can imagine how hard it is for them to completely reimagine what it's like to clean and the solutions that they're going to be cleaning with. And I use this emoji because it really is mind blowing. When you go to a custodian who's been using, you know, X chemicals for 30 years and you tell them they're going to clean with water, um, you know, miraculous water, um, it is mind blowing. It's very hard to wrap your mind around that. So, so how did we create this, this, this culture where people are using it and believing it in, and, you know, we got to this place where we could expand it. Um, so the, the most powerful way, of course, is with data, um, you know, proving that it works and most importantly, proving that it works over and over and over again. So I mentioned when we did that pilot that we um, use these APT, ATP meters to test bacteria. So after that pilot, every year we've gradually, you know, I said we're in 70 buildings now, but every year for the last five years, we've, you know, expanded to more and more buildings every year. And so every time, the first three years, every time I expanded to new buildings, I did bacteria ATP meter testing. And I will tell you that every time I did it, I got the exact same results. Um, 
And I knew, but you know, by the time I hit my 40th building, I had exactly you know what I was going to find in my assessment. But it was really important for the custodians to see me doing it and see the results themselves in their spaces on their surfaces with you know their type of cleaning. Um, so um, while I knew what I was going to find, um, proving it worked, um, you know, with science, with data in front of them you know, over and over again um, was really important. I think this year was the first year where I didn't feel um, the group didn't ask me for it and I didn't feel the need where I needed to do it and we were, you know, good to go. And ATP meters are actually relatively cheap. I mean, they're like a couple hundred dollars and um, I can't tell you how much it aided kind of the success and buy-in from people just, um, you know, the the getting back to the mind blowingness, the the, the solution um, doesn't bubble, it doesn't smell, it doesn't have a color to it. So it doesn't have any of those traditional characteristics of a traditional cleaning product. So um, it's, it's, you know, one of the things that, it's hard to know if it's working, right? And when you take out the bacteria meter, you can see very quickly that it's working and then get by and quickly to move forward. So um, we use this. I also used a ORP meter, which basically tests ozone because um, obviously very important to our custodians is that it kills bacteria and viruses and that's where the ozone comes into play and so the ozone has to be at a certain level for it to do that so once again we got another gadget that um, ensures that the ozone is at the level needed to kill um, and proved that that worked over and over and over again even though i knew what the results were likely to be but them seeing it was really important for themselves um, the other cool thing um, that helped with creating a new cleaning culture was um, and investing in new equipment for the custodians. I mean, obviously, they got ex they get excited when they um, are treated, uh, you know, you know, special or given. Um, all we all do, we get a new computer or we get a new phone or whatever it is. It kind of brightens our day and our work experience. And um, every time that we've rolled out this green cleaning system, the custodians not only get the the new cleaning system, they also get a whole new suite of equipment and materials to use. So um, at the same time we roll this in, we also transition to microfiber. Um, I won't go into that, but you can kind of Google benefits of microfiber if you're not using microfiber. So um, we historically just use, you know, white cotton towels. And so when they get these new machines, they also get all new, beautifully colored microfiber so that they can use the color coding to clean properly in the different spaces. Lots of benefits to that. They get new, bop, new mop buckets, they get new spray bottles. Um, you can't use this solution in um, mop buckets and bottles that had other chemical residue in it. So it's just a good opportunity to kind of um, kind of reset them and this is kind of a nice benefit for them as they get the new machines to have this this um, all of these other new items um, we also have a ozone cleaner user group um, that meets uh, in the beginning we were meeting very frequently and now I'm, I would say it's like once or twice a year um, all the custodians that are now in this ozone cleaning user group get together we talk about how things are going what's working on where what surfaces what concerns they've had um, like at a very high level, what I've gotten out of these user groups is um, constantly they love it on stainless steel, like your uh, knobs, door knobs, sink faucets, toilet, you know, flushing handles, uh, mirrors. They say it works like no other product on, you know, shining those and polishing those. And they get obviously satisfaction from seeing that, that shine. Um, and then, of course, I hear about the no smell a lot and the relief of like not having to smell chemicals. Um, but it's not always peachy. So on the negative side, um, I've used these meetings to clear up confusion. So um, there are, you know, tricks and rules that come along with this. And one of it is, is it it only kills viruses and bacteria for up to 24 hours. So um, and, and then it starts degrading and going back to water. So, um, you know, they'll tell me, you know, something's not working and I'll say, well, where, when's the last time you filled up your bottle and it will have been four days ago, right? 
And so I use these meetings to, you know, they'll tell me things aren't working and then I have to kind of uh, reiterate how the system works. Like the kill is only 24 hours. And we really got into this train of you need to fill up a bottle every day because it, um, you know, it's only effective for 24 hours. Um, also, they were using, I showed you what the degreaser looked like, which was that nice blue solution, which looks more like a traditional chemical. And so they saw it was blue and they thought it was more powerful than the other one. And so while it really only degreases, I had custodial teams that were using it for everything because they just thought it looked more powerful and more, you know, useful. Um, and so I'd have to clear up, you know, what the degree surface is for and what the other one is for. Um, I'm obviously, as the year goes, years go by, I'm doing less and less of that, but these groups were great for clearing up confusion. Um, and then the other one I want to mention that frequently comes up is whitening. Um, this solution does not whiten. And custodians, um, or our custodians get an immediate satisfaction from from seeing something that's sparkly white. Um, and this is not going to do that. So um, you have mold or mildew or a coffee stain in a sink, you know, you pour bleach on it, it magically goes away. <laughs> um, you know, it, it whitens and brightens and you don't see that anymore. And um, this solution does not have a whitening effect. And so the custodians weren't feeling, they take great pride in their work. And they, when they were leaving spaces, they just weren't feeling, um, when it wasn't, and certain things weren't sparkling white, they weren't feeling good about their work. Um, and so um, I had to figure out how I was going to kind of uh, combat that. So um, I figured the only person that could really do that and make them feel comfortable was um, our director. So the director of student housing who made the goal and invested in this actually um, came and met with the custodians and said, we have a new policy. It's okay, it's not white. It does not mean it's not clean. Um, and once again, we took out the bacteria test, you know, um, uh, tester and showed them that just because it wasn't sparkly white didn't mean that it wasn't clean and that their health was more important to us than seeing something being sparkly white. And so much so that we actually changed our grout standard. So we, our old grout standard used to be white and now it's like a, off, you know, off white beige color um, in response to us adopting this because we didn't want custodians to feel that pressure of having it sparkly white. Um, we wanted them using this. We wanted it. It's good for their health. We know it's just as clean. And so we went as far as we're actually changing our standards to things that one, don't stain or hold stains quite as easily where you need that, you know, immediate white satisfaction. Um, um, so, so, um, sorry, um, so standards are being changed and, um, you know, having that management coming and telling them that really helps set it at ease, that um, to not feel that, that pressure. Um, so the other things we've done to create a culture of change is um, partnering with academics um, departments and uh, more, even more partnerships with students. We have a student internship program where we hire over 20 students a year. Many of them work on our grain cleaning program doing custodial closet surveys, um, interviews with custodians, helping us train students on how to use the systems where we offer it. Um, what I'm going to particularly mention, which is, which is, Amazing. Uh, we partnered with the Stanford Design School um, to do a, uh, a study on adoption of the system amongst custodians. This was very early on in the first two years um, and then student awareness of the system. And um, for those of you who um, that could benefit from this, you can just Google design thinking uh, Stanford and you'll get all these videos that talk about design thinking. But we really use this methodology, not just in green cleaning, but in all of the projects that we do. It's really great at kind of assessing and improving processes um, and services and products. Um, so we had a team of students and this is them presenting here in this picture, their findings. and. Um, I, I wanted to find out like what were barriers to custodians accepting this in the first you know two years or three years we were rolling this out, and so they went in and um, observed custodians cleaning. They interviewed custodians. Um, they interviewed students, um, and none of the these people knew that it was for the purposes of understanding behavior change and adoption of this new cleaning system. Um, they thought that these students were just interested in custodians and custodial cleaning in general. So the custodians were very upfront with them. Um, 
they are very friendly and we learned amazing things, which I'm gonna cover. So um, the first amazing thing that I learned was that when I was training new custodians that were getting the system, I was always saying it's just water. And I was saying it's just water because I wanted the custodians to really embrace the environmental and health benefits from it. Um, and by saying it's just water, I was I was trying to like uh, con you know convince them or get them on board with the environmental and health benefits from it. And what we heard from the design school study was that when I said it's just water, they heard it doesn't work. <laughs> um, it's just water. How could it possibly work? It doesn't work. Um, and I had no idea that I was doing that, and I had no idea that how that message that I was giving them, how that was being received. But in, t in tons of interviews they had with custodians that were using it, um, they would all say exactly what I said. It's just water, so it doesn't work. It's not a cleaning solution. And so, um, you know, after the study, I had to completely reframe, you know, or reframe, excuse me, um, how I communicated uh, the initiative and the trainings, especially to new custodians, that it's a powerful cleaning solution. It's not just water, right? Um, but it is just water. But I, I didn't realize I was doing that. So that was an interesting finding that I had to redo our communications for. Um, another interesting finding was, um, I'm gonna show you some of the communication pieces um, that we've used for, um, for this program. Um, we inspired them from Stanford's, one of Stanford's mascots, the tree, which you see on here, which changes design every year, but it's always this funky tree. And so um, these are, the kind of the old communication pieces that we would put out. So this is what we put in custodial closets. It says new to Stanford, healthy cleaning is our standard. We only use two things. Um, and this was mostly designed because we have so many temps and casual employees that come in to our buildings, especially during the summer that uh, we wanted a, a quick way to tell them um, you know, what we were doing, where I may not have time to train everybody. We wanted this right in front of them in their closets. So this little tree guy, you know, representing our tree was kind of branded on all of our communication pieces. This is the early one we put out to students. You see the little tree guy again on the right. Um, we designed bottle labels, the tree guy. Um, and what was interesting is, um, once again, these design students um, looked at our communication materials. They interviewed students um, that were looking at them. And another fascinating finding came out of this. Um, they said that a barrier that came out in the interviews was that my branding with my tree guy um, didn't look like other cleaning chemicals on the market. And they would believe in it more if it looked more like other things that they would see, like Tide, you know, or Windex or whatever. Um, so I went back to my communications department and we rebranded it to Cardinal Clean. Um, and um, it looks like this, um, a little more, I think what you would see, the idea was to look at, make it look like they said, like something, a cleaning product more that you would see on the market. So um, the bottom right here is the new bottle label. So you see the old one, it's a little blurry, but it's got the tree pictures on it. The new one's got the Cardinal Clean label um, with kind of a, a, a branding that looks more like other traditional chemicals on the market. Um, the great reminder, it only lasts up for after 24 hours on there. Um, and then this is just an example of how the left is how we used to tell students about it. So since it doesn't smell, you know, all students aren't aware of, you know, how their buildings are clean. We put these signs up in the bathroom telling, telling students that this is what their custodians are doing and to be excited and happy with the way their facilities are being ran. So the old one is on the left. It says green cleaning has come to your residence. And then the new one with the new branding with, uh, it looks more like a, you know, other things that they would see uh, much more visually stimulated, more graphics. Um, our new one is on the right. You know, did you know your custodians are using engineered water ozone to clean? And it tells them what it is and the benefits of it. Um, these are the new posters. So this was the old one that we put into custodial closets with the tree. Um, these are the new ones with the new Cardinal Clean brand. But um, again, kind of saying the same type of information, mostly targeted at people who aren't typically in our closets using the system. So um, I'm wrapping up here. Um, my last way of creating change is obviously to recognize champions. Um, in the early days, we gave out awards. Um, 
we had students that would um, go into all the custodial closets and make sure other kind of chemicals didn't creep their way back in. And if custodian closets got clear reports, they would get custodians in that area would get dining hall lunches and that's a great treat or incentive for them. Um, we have amazing dining halls on our campus with healthy, organic, fresh foods. Um, and so giving them free lunches or free dinners at the dining halls for having you know, uh, clean closet records um, was a hit. Um, and then lastly, letting them lead. Um, so one of my proudest moments in this program is this picture on the left. So the, the first two to three years that we were rolling this out, um, I was the face of the program. I was the one doing all the training. This is how you use the machine. You know, this is how you clean with it. This is, you know, I was the, the, the leader and the face of it. Um, and I, um, probably about two years ago now, I invited um, Everado, who you see kind of pictured in the back in front of the machine, um, to come help me uh, train the next set of custodians getting it. And he completely took off. He just um, took off with the training all by himself. And he was telling them, you know, all of the benefits about it and um, how the machine works and what they need to do and how it's changed and transformed the way he cleans. And I had like goosebumps going up my arms because, you know, here, you know, you know that you've succeeded in culture change when, you know, you're no longer needed. And I had, you know, custodians up there, you know, being the ones that were leading the change for me. And it was just this beautiful, wonderful moment. Um, and, you know, it used to be the first two years that, you know, I would hear from other buildings, I hope I'm on the end of the list and, you know, the ozone solution never comes to me. And now all I hear is, why am I not next? Why, are, why aren't we getting it this year? When do we get it? How can you move me up? Like I want it, I want it. So um, that's when you really know that, that you know, you've hit it and, um, you know, we've, we've made movement. So um, that is the end. I want to say that I am, I, I'm here to, you know, Hopefully you guys all know this reference. Help me help you. I am here to support you. I think this is kind of the future for zero waste, for creating a sustainable future um, for our bodies, for the planet, and for the finances of our companies. Um, and I would love to support you in any way that I can and kind of um, looking at these types of systems. My email is here on the bottom um, and I am happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Kristin. We do have a long list of questions, so um, I will encourage everyone to submit your questions and we'll try to go through as many as we can in the 13 minutes left in this webinar. Uh, let me turn on my webcam here. So, are you advertising this to students prior to moving? Um, we so far we haven't it's in their bathrooms the sign that i showed you when they move in however i showed you i showcased the uh 2400 student 12 story high rises that are opening um this summer and we are advertising it to students moving in those buildings as an amenity of um uh, moving into those buildings is having it. So um, all those students moving in are hearing about it before they move in, um, but the other students are hearing about it when they arrive and getting trained on it when they arrive. Thank you. So getting custodians to buy and to change can be very difficult. Can you describe the your initial process? I guess you mentioned this a little bit after this question was asked, that you used to uh, in order to get the custodial buy-in to change into a chemical that has no odor. Um, yeah, I, I think I probably covered that in the culture change section, the different things that we did, but it, it wasn't easy. I mean, it's, um, you know, I think the, the biggest missing factor, I mean, they definitely was the smell, but it's also the bubbling. Um, we, we have a lot of scrubbing bubble fans um, in our custodial group, and that's got a great bubbling action thing that happens that makes you feel like something's happening and interacting and with ozone you really don't see that that interaction happening so um, once again that's where the atp meter the ozone meter um, those things were really helpful because you can't see it so you got to have some way of of showing it thank you um, all right, so there's a couple of questions on the disinfecting power <laughs> of this solution. Yeah. 
if it disinfects bacteria, why does it not replace disinfectants? And what chemical do you use to disinfect surfaces? The yeah, we actually use this. Um, this is our disinfectant. This is our sanitizer. Um, but like I said, it's really important because it only does that within a 24 hour period. And so on the bottle label I showed you, it's very big that says, um, we have this practice that says, fill up a bottle, a fresh bottle every single day. That's just, so you don't have to worry about the 24 hour thing or when did I fill it up? Just get a fresh bottle every day because it will disinfect and sanitize within that you know, initial 24 hour period. Um, however, I would say um, in some, so our custodial team does not, clean on Sundays um, and occasionally some Saturdays. Um, and if there's, if we have fear of some kind of outbreak or something occurring, they will put a different uh, aerosol sanitizer in the bathroom so that when we know we don't have good custodial cleaning coverage um, and it's not available in like a laundry room for a student to dispense, the student has an option to sanitize or disinfect when we are not there. But the sad thing is our standard for that has a kill time of like almost 10 minutes. So like it has to sit there for 10 minutes before it kills, you know, even the one that we provide for students to use um, when we're not cleaning as opposed to this, which is like pretty quickly. Thank you. So there were a couple of really specific questions. Would this be effective for cleaning staff? There was a high school that had to wipe down lockers when they had an outbreak. Great. Also, uh, with that question, what about cleaning bodily fluids? And uh, yeah. yeah, so I believe staff is covered. I mean, I know E. coli, norovirus, all of those are. Um, our athletics department actually recently asked about that. Um, so I, I don't want to like give a complete affirmative on that. I believe so, but I think it's something that, that you should look into on your own. Um, and then in terms of bodily fluids, um, Stanford actually has a policy and a protocol and a kit for dealing with bodily fluids. And so we defer to that for uh, bodily fluid cleanup. Um, obviously, pee around urines and pee on the floor, we don't, but other bodily fluid situations have to go to the mandatory kit procedure. Um, that is outside of this process. Yeah, there were a couple of questions on cleaning blood and also if it can be safely used in hospitals. Yes, there are hospitals that are using it. And I've actually talked to the Stanford Hospital about um, using it um, here on campus. So, yes. All right. How many gallons of solution does a cartridge produce and what is the approximate cost per cartridge? Um, so, um, the, so the amount of cartridges, so the only thing that you have to replace or buy in the system is a filter that filters the water before it goes in the unit. And so the amount of filters you go through depends on how much solution you use, right? So I mentioned in our model, it depends on how convenient you make it. So if you have one machine that's supplying like, you know, four 12 story buildings, you're going to go through filters in that machine a lot quicker, you know. So I would say in our model, we have, you know, probably one machine per 80 to 100 students. Um, we're going through filters about once a year. Um, um, every eight to 12 months, we go through a filter on it. So it's not like something you're changing daily, weekly, or even monthly. Um, it's like a once to, you know, uh, maximum twice a year type of initiative. Um, in terms of cost, the filters are way cheaper than the chemicals that 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 we purchase. I mean, they're in like the one to three hundred dollar range. And how did moving to the system as well as sharing it with students impact your water bill? That is a great question. So so I talked about all the environmental benefits of, um, you know, not putting toxins on the drain, the pollution, you know, plastic pollution, all of that stuff. But you are, you're right, you're using electricity and water. And so I was kind of curious to see uh, what the impact was. And so I had an actual another intern that looked at we have. Um, our metering only goes down to the building level. So, you know, I don't have uh, metering beyond that, but looking at all of the buildings where we're using the ozone cleaning solution compared to the buildings we aren't, um, they're really, we can't see any electrical or um, water increase from using the system. And especially because when you look at the overall water usage of our buildings, I mean, it's so intensive it's so on showering and laundry, and laundry and that, that 
um, it's like um, negligible it's like to even see um, how much is being used by this. And also we've done so many energy efficiency initiatives that our electricity consumption has gone down so much in the last three years that I, I can't see like a blimp from these, this plug, you know, the plug loads from these. So um, I don't have an exact number for you, but for us, it's, it's not significant enough to even register um, in our billing. Okay. Um, does rewetting the mop affect the performance of the cleaning solution? So if it touches the, if it loses its sanitizing capability when contaminated with dirt? No, it doesn't lose its capability when it contacts other things if it's within the first 24 hours. So the solution comes out already, you know, diluted or whatever. So if you're filling a mop bucket, you're not adding any other water to it. You fill up the mop bucket with a solution and then you're putting your mop in there and you're not adding any other water to the situation other than if you want to like wash it down afterwards. Okay. That answers that question. And um so i think you mentioned cleaning the showers but this was about deep cleaning after students have lived the whole year would this work for a deep clean please? yeah we've done some pilots um or tests on like major turns like where somebody's been in the apartment for the whole year and it's actually holding up pretty well um especially in the apartment i mentioned where we actually offer it um definitely they have to let it sit um, for a while, but to be honest, we had to let, when we were using other chemicals, we had to let it sit for a while and then they would come back to and clean it. So I wouldn't say it's been any different than um, deep cleaning. Um, the one thing I didn't mention is, so I mentioned we have that in a degreaser. Um, when ovens, so like in uh, student apartments, if ovens are in a very uh, nasty place, um, we have sometimes had to bring an oven cleaner um, specific for that purpose so i would I, I think in my advertisement for this i said we have three you know we went down from 30 to three and my my third is an oven cleaner when we have a whole year of no one cleaning an oven and you know it's in a bad place it's not gonna like get out what you could imagine is burnt in there yeah there was actually a question on uh greasy areas does it remove fingerprints which are oily or this is something where the degreaser would need to be used first. And also what about dining floors and kitchen greasy areas? Yeah, you would use the degreaser. So our practice is, you know, in those spaces and the showers where I talked about the greasiness, you use they use the degreaser first and they clean off with the degreaser and then they go back over it with the ozone solution to prevent the mold, mildew, sanitize, disinfect um, after they've degreased it. So it's kind of a dual process. You're degreasing and then you're preventing mold mildew and doing the, the sanitation, yeah. What about uh, descaling hard water deposits? Um, like preventing and yeah, we haven't ha heard, we haven't had any issues with that, yeah. Okay, and uh, did you use this to reduce, replace laundry detergent? Yes, so it can be used as a laundry detergent. Um, our custodians use it as a laundry detergent when they're cleaning their uh, mop heads and their rags, and students use it as a laundry detergent. But again, as I cautioned before, there is like no magical whitening function in it, right? So we have to kind of, you have to be willing to accept that. So just as an example, in my home, I use green cleaning detergent and it never gets the, things as white or the stain now perfectly like um you know a traditional detergent but i accept that because it's my family and i you know i i want to do better things for the environment and for our health so um the detergent it's great for detergent it cleans but if you have um we we, we cook a lot with turmeric you got a turmeric stain in there it's not going to be bright white after you stain something with turmeric right so um and you know you you have to accept that to some extent. I don't know how to say that. Yeah. Um, what about using gloves? Do they, yeah, the custodians need to use gloves? Um, they don't have to. I mean, if you look at the, the safety rating, um, the MSDS for it, you don't have to, but we still ask them to. Um, so they still wear gloves. They still actually wear their eyeglasses. Um, when they're using it, but it's not, it's technically not required, but we ask our custodians to, and they, they do as just, 
extra precaution because that's what we've always done. All right, so we have one minute left, but we have a couple more questions. So um, let, let's just go through them quickly. Um, so did you consider hypochlorous acid or sodium hydroxide systems? And if you did, why did you go with the aqueous ozone? Um, we did not. I'm sorry, okay. I don't have a right, comparison point for you. Uh, why did you choose this company, the Tersano? Was it cost or? Um, we brought in, like I said, we brought in a variety of vendors um, and obviously we had different criteria for environmental, for health, for um, cost, for um, service, um, for all of these reasons and, um, you know, ended up selecting. And yeah. can you share the cost or the ballpark of uh, one system to be sold into an existing custodial clothes closet? Like the parts, the system, the labor for cooking it up? Um, I think that would be a good follow up question if somebody wants to contact me directly. Um, you know, I need to look at all of our, it, it kind of it varies widely <laughs> depending on what I was walking into in terms of the the custodial closet situation. So, and then, you know, how big of a space I was trying to service. So I'd rather not like provide one figure, but um, you know, if they want to contact me directly, we can kind of get to the specifics of what they would be doing and I can share that. Thank you so much, Christine. And we're at time with the webinar. So if there's additional questions, you can email Christine directly or contact us at education at I want to thank Christine for sharing your expertise with us today. Definitely, this was a very interesting topic to our attendees. Uh, before we conclude today's webinar, I'd like to let everyone know that this was actually the last webinar of the year for AISHI, but we will be rolling a new schedule starting the second half of January. And you can learn more about these webinars and our other professional development offerings on our website or by subscribing to AISHI's newsletters. So I mentioned at the beginning that the recording and presentational materials will be available in the AC Campus Sustainability tomorrow. And I received approval to have it open for non ac members as well. So you'll receive a um, email notification probably uh, uh, tomorrow around this time with the link to the recording and uh, uh, Christine's presentation. So thanks again, Christine, and everyone for attending today. Have a good day. Thanks.